Uh, bonjour, good morning. Um, um, that's all the French you'll get out of me. So um, I want to thank everyone for taking time to come to this presentation that we're going to be doing uh, on hydrofracking and the testing for the workers' exposure. I know that you ha all have a lot to do here, and your time is very uh, precious for all the networking you can do and all the technical sessions and that. So I, again, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ed Stuber. I'm a CIH with Galton Laboratories. We're an industrial hygiene analytical laboratory in Syracuse, New York. And for all my Canadian friends and clients, we do have a, a client service center now in the Mississauga, uh, 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 Ontario region. So we're trying to do more to service our Canadian friends. We're going to talk about hydrofracking and uh, worker exposures to various contaminants and what we developed in order to uh, help those workers uh, be protected from those contaminants. Which one is it? That one? Okay, got it. So uh, I assume that most of you know what hydrofracking is. There's been a big buzz about it. Uh, everybody has an idea of what we're talking about with hydrofracking, right? All right, for, so for the most part. So what I'm going to do is just briefly give you a a little overview of, of what we're talking about here and, and what the buzz is all about and what we're doing about it here with this kit. But essentially hydrofracking is just the forcing of water, sand, various chemicals down a, um, a well. Uh, it goes vertically for over a mile. Then it'll go horizontal for maybe another mile or so. Uh, under high pressure, the sand will and the water and the, and the chemicals will open up fissures in previously impermeable. Uh, uh, rock formation, usually shale, but not always. Uh, the gas and oil is then released. Uh, it'll pass up, uh, be collected on the surface, transported away, either refined or utilized by the public. Um, in this particular picture, you'll see uh, some, some interesting things where there's a blue line through there. Uh, that's an aquifer. You see groundwater. Uh, at the surface there, and then a drinking water well at a home site there, and some question marks around that, and I'm going to briefly touch on that here shortly, and then we'll move into what we can do about the workers and their exposures. There's a little bit of controversy, and that's what the big buzz is right now, and the controversy is primarily with environmental issues, whether or not, and you saw in that picture before, the hydrofracking causes problems with, uh, with the groundwater, with the well water, with the aquifers. There's two distinct camps. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. They both present evidence um, to the contrary of each other. And so the jury is out on that. Um, I know that in New York State, my home state where we're at, we, we, we cannot do hydrofracking. Uh, the political climate is not going to allow it. The public doesn't want it for the most part. Uh, but right across the state in Pennsylvania, they're just going guns ablaze. The, the, the economy's booming. They're building hotels. They're building restaurants. People are working. They're just going great guns there. So those are the two spectrums. And, but I'm here to say controversy. I don't think so. Not when it comes to workers' exposures to contaminants on a hydrofracking site. And what you're going to see, here's a typical hydrofracking site. And, and a typical hydrofracking site is not like a typical work site. It's not a factory. It's not a refinery. It's not a building. Uh, for the most part, these hydrofracking sites are out in the country somewhere. They're on somebody's back 40. This is farmland, as you can see. There's a, a shed there. There's probably no roads that were present there until the hydrofracking people got there and uh, built them for access. So they're, you're, they're located, you know, in the most part, isolated from everyone else. So it's a different work site. And it's a multiple type of work site where you got drillers coming in, then you got the water trucks coming in, you got the people making the wells, then you got the fracking going on, then you got removal of that. So a lot of different things are going on at a hydrofracking site. And here you can see, well, I say there's no controversy. Um, you can see at a, at a typical site here that they've got noise issues. They do have some hearing protection. You've got 
dust and silica, which is what you can see there. They got some respiratory protection there. Uh, what you can't see is diesel exhaust from the, all the different moving uh, pieces of equipment that they have there. Um, there's the, the drilling itself, so there's a lot of particulate diesel there. And then finally, what you can't see is hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide, a lot of these sites, anytime you're dealing with oil and gas, natural gas and that, potentially you're going to be dealing with uh, hydrogen sulfide. And a lot of these sites have very specific hydrogen sulfide training that needs to be done. Also, they need to maybe have um, direct read instruments with alarms set for hydrogen sulfide, et cetera. So the potential for exposure to hydrogen sulfide is uh, always present. Now, I said there's no controversy, and why do we know there's no controversy in trying to protect workers from these, what we call the big four, silica, per, uh, silica particulate, uh, diesel, noise, and hydrogen sulfide? Well, we know, we know from, a, from a 2010 NIOSH study that uh, they collected silica samples at various fracking sites, and they turned out to have quite a lot of overexposures to silica. And you're going to see that what's being done is, is studies with silica, but we can use common sense and say, well, if they're dealing with silica and they're having these problems, there's probably a noise issue that we can see that you saw before. There's also potential for diesel particulate and, of course, the hydrogen sulfide that's always going to be present. So we know that there is some issues with silica. Uh, just last year, OSHA and NIOSH combined and published a hazard alert on uh, the dangers of silica exposure at fracking sites. So with these two things, we're learning more and more about the hazards that are, that are happening on these sites. I don't mean to put myself in the publication the same uh, level with NIOSH and OSHA, but I do some blogging on our, on our website, and one of my, uh, my uh, passions is, is uh, silica and hydrofrac. I'm a little nerdy about that. so. If you go to our website, you can read about what my thoughts are about the hydrofracking and the silica exposures. You'll be able to get this PowerPoint presentation at the end so you don't have to take any, any websites down or anything. Um, I'm going to show a short video with no audio about a hydrofracking site. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight as it's going the study that, w that was done by the NIOSH and the silica uh, exposures just so you get an idea of what we're talking about for these exposures. This is a uh, typical hydrofracking site in Pennsylvania. And I said NIOSH conducted a study in, 20, in 2010. Uh, they took 116 air samples from 11 hyd uh, hydrofracking sites in Pennsylvania, Texas, Arkansas, Colorado, and North Dakota. 79% of these samples, the silica exceeded the REL. 79% exceeded the REL. 47% exceeded the PEL by OSHA. When you exceed an OSHA PEL, you've got an overexposure. The workers are in danger. Silicosis, we all know the hazards in that. 47, 47%. Furthermore, 31% of the samples were 10 times the REL. So not only were you having an overexposure of uh, the 79%, 31% was 10 times, and that's what got, that really got NIOSH uh, concerned when you've got a 10-fold ten uh, exposure factor. NIOSH went on to say that all hydrofracking sites should evaluate their operations to determine the potential for worker exposures to silica, and that the current use of half-mask respirators is inadequate for pre preventing silica exposure. You can see that's, that's not a good situation to be in. So, what, so what, did, what did Galson do when they got this information or they heard this information? Galson did what we do best. We innovated. We created something that would make uh, workers' exposure to these hazards uh, easy to be uh, sampled for and then be able to put them in the proper protection that needed to be done. 
And we did this by creating a kit. And uh, four or five years ago, we created a kit for lead testing. And uh, it was all inclusive big for the indoor air quality um, uh, credit. We probably sent out thousands of kits for that. A couple of years ago, we created an MCHA kit because MCHA stopped uh, sampling for noise and silica on above ground uh, mines, uh, metal and non-metal mines. So we created a kit for them because the miners, the mine company still had the sample for their workers, but now MCHA wouldn't do that for them. So we helped them with that kit. So we thought, well, we'll do the same thing for these hydrofracking companies. We'll create a kit. And we created the kit the same way that we created all our kits. We made it very flexible. We made it so that you can interchange whatever parts you want to do. Our basic kit will have the big four if you want it, the diesel, the noise, the, the silica, and the H2S. But you can add aldehydes to it if you want. You can add inorganic acids to it if you want. You can add uh, VOCs to it if you want. You can cut it back to just noise if you want. You can interchange these. And what you're going to get with your kit, you can see there's one type of kit right there. It's a, it's a single kit for one of each of those, uh, one of the each components that we talked about. Comes in a hard case uh, cooler like that. Very easy to ship, very easy to get. Or you can get multiple components and have something come in like this. Nice Pelican case um, container. It's got foam inserts for all the components to keep them safe. And what you're going to get for your various components, your silica, you'll get everything for silica. You've got the cyclone. We're going to calibrate the pump for you. You can do post pre-calibration. We'll send that for you. You'll be able to do your silica sampling. Uh, one of the things that we did for uh, hydrogen sulfide is we decided to go with the radiello badge. If you're not familiar with these badges, you should familiarize yourself. There's a lot of them out there for all the different components. These are high volume passive uh, flow rates for um, various contaminants. This one is for hydrogen sulfide. Um, we use this instead of a badge or instead of a pump and a tube so that the worker doesn't have to get too tangled up with all these. It's much easier to wear one of these. Uh, because of the design, again, you get a higher flow rate over the course of the day that gives you more air. You get more air, you're going to get a lower detection limit, bottom line. Diesel particulate, it's just going to be uh, NIOSH 5040. It's elemental carbon. You're probably aware of that. We can handle that with the same kit here. The noise, we would recommend with the noise using the Edge 5. If you haven't seen these, they're really neat, slick little things. They clip on, they're wireless. The, the, the um, windscreen doesn't come off. You can go with the wired ones with the pack here and the wire that comes up and the microphone. But when you remember the picture of the, of the thing here, you've got all these sharp corners, tight, tight spaces, um, machines moving around. Those wires can really get pulled apart, and, you're, and you may not be able to use uh, the data from that. So I would recommend going with the wireless on these. You can take one set. You can take 10, as many as you need. We include the shipping with everything. Um, we send the calibrator for the noise dosimetry. And what you do, everything comes, you order it, go to the, goes in the box, comes out, ship it to the site, ship it to the hotel, ship it to your office. Shipping's included with what we, what we provide for you. So it's a one-stop, one-pay type thing. Collect your samples. We send you all the, the manuals, instructions. We have videos on our website. Very easy to do. Collect your samples, put everything back in the box, send it to us. We'll download the data for the, the data logging on the noise dosimetry. We'll analyze the samples. We'll create a report. We'll put the noise report together, put a cover letter on it, send it to you. You're all set. Um, there's not one other thing you need to do. Uh, if you have any trouble interpreting the results, we'll be glad to help you with that. So the bottom line is we try to make it as easy as possible for you to collect these samples at a hydrofracking site and protect those workers. We know there's silica exposure. We know there's noise exposure. And we're pretty sure there's going to be a lot of diesel exposure. And of course, the hydrogen sulfide is always going to be a problem. And then there'll also be other components too if you want to add them because not everybody uses the same, not everybody uses the same ch uh, chemical, so you're going to have to work with, with whoever you're dealing with on those. I think that's it about the kit. Um, 
I'm going to be here at our booth right over there, 1015. I'll be more than happy to answer questions there. We'll have the kit over there also. We have flyers if you're interested in more about the material. If you want a copy of this PowerPoint presentation, you can uh, give your card or, or email to Joe DeLeo. He's, he helped me put this together. Uh, and I think I do have a, some few minutes right now if you want to ask me questions, actually. Yes, sir. Pardon? We do not analyze any water. Um, I say there's controversy whether or not hydrofracking is causing problems with water. We don't get into that. It's just the workers' protection. Yeah, for the most part, we've dealt with uh, noise and silica. We've done a, a private study with uh, a consultant in a, uh, an oil industry uh, company, and um, depend there is there is because there's, there's no protection at all. There, and some of these things are running wide open with with exhaust. Um, it's a problem. It's a problem. Yes, most definitely. Okay, uh, like I say, I'll be over there if, if you have any, uh, if you want to talk to me or look at the kit. Thank you.